in terms of asking questions, in terms of asking questions we, we definitely encourage you to ask questions. There are a couple of different ways that you could ask a question. Um, one is if you go down to the participants um, item in the, the menu um, and click on that, then you'll see once that, that opens a window, you'll see that there's a raise hand um, little icon towards the bottom. So if you, if you click on that, um, then uh, Amy uh, will be monitoring um, that and she'll let me or whoever's instructing at the moment know that there's a question um, and will then give you the opportunity to ask your question verbally. Um, so I definitely encourage you to do that if, you, if you'd like to do that so that this can be as interactive as possible. Um, the other possibility is you could type your, your, your question into the chat window. And then either one of one of my colleagues will just answer in the chat window, or if if we think it's a general enough question, then the one of the, then the person uh, leading the training at the moment may also address it verbally. So either of those are options. Um, and then at the end of the of the training, um, we'll have the a number of my my colleagues are here, and so we have have the opportunity to chat with you about um, sort of more in depth questions that, might, that you might have. And we can use the Zoom breakout rooms uh, feature for that. So if you're interested in that, uh, stick around and we'll, we'll try and organize that at the end. Okay, so the, the goal of the training here is really to talk through uh, different ways that you can set up um, parallel jobs and run those jobs on Savio and monitor those jobs and make sure they're doing what you expect. Um, we're not gonna talk about how you actually write uh, parallel code in any detail. That's sort of a very large topic, much larger than we could address here. And there's also a real diversity of ways that you could be writing uh, parallel code, ranging from using tools in Python or R or MATLAB to writing your own uh, C or C++ code that calls out to lower level libraries. Um, so there's a, a huge diversity of things that you, that you could do, and we're not really going to go into those here, but we are going to cover for those various ways of, that one might have, have um, written parallel code, we will cover how you would then go about submitting uh, things like that to, to Savio or other clusters that, that use Slurm or similar kinds of schedulers. Okay, so hopefully everybody got the email in advance, um, giving them indication of where the materials are. We encourage you to, to follow along um, and uh, we'll be doing some demos. I don't think I will be, but uh, the other, some of the other instructors will be doing some demos. So you may want to, um, open up a, uh, a terminal and log into your Savio account if you'd like to, to follow along directly. Um, but if you do need to get the materials right now, probably the easiest way is just to, to go to this tinyurl.com slash brc dash April 20. Okay, so I'm gonna um, present the first introduction given kind of an overview of terms and concepts, uh, the hardware that a, that a, a cluster will have and then some of the basic approaches that uh, one may use for uh, parallel jobs. And then uh, Nicholas will talk specifically about submitting and monitoring parallel jobs on Savio. And then Christopher will talk about um, taking advantage of parallelization capabilities in existing software, in particular uh, in bioinformatics software. And then Wei is gonna be talking about how to basically combine together multiple jobs into one sort of giant super job um, using a tool called GNU Parallel. And then time permitting, I'll probably just briefly talk about um, some of the capabilities um, for parallelization in sort of standard software like Python R and MATLAB. Okay, so let me, um, let's just see an overview of what the Savio system uh, looks like. And this is not so dissimilar from other uh, high performance computing clusters or Linux clusters that you might encounter or already have encountered in your, uh, in your careers. Um, so basically, when you log on to Savio, you're on one of the login nodes, which is indicated here with this LN0001020203. I'm expecting that most of you will be familiar with submitting jobs on Savio. And so in order to actually do any work, um, you need to submit your, your code for, to be run on, on one or more of the compute nodes. And so the submission would happen using the Slurm software, using the commands either sbatch or srun. So that submits your job to the scheduler. And then the scheduler, based on your submission, then goes and finds one or more nodes on which it can run your job. So each of these little cylinders here in sort of the bottom part of the picture is meant to indicate one uh, node or computer or machine that is part of the overall uh, Linux cluster that is, uh, that is Savio. So when we're talking about running jobs in parallel, we're talking about either using uh, multiple CPUs or cores on a single uh, node, so sort of a single one of these cylinders, or we're talking about using um, CPUs or cores across multiple of nodes. So you might ask for say four nodes and you might get a collection of four nodes um, on which to run your code. 
The other thing I'll note here is just that in terms of um, communication of data and code um, across the various pieces of the system here, when you're running code on the compute nodes on Savio, those nodes are linked together by very fast networking called InfiniBan. And they're also linked by the same fast networking to your global scratch area. And so that means that data that you were loading to and from um, your compute job off of scratch uh, can get loaded quite quickly. Um, in contrast, if you were to load data from your home directory, which we discourage, it would get loaded in much more, much more slowly. Okay, so if we think about uh, this uh, sort of graphical cartoon of, of a cluster, and let's take one of these cylinders. One of these cylinders is basically like a desktop machine, and each and that desktop machine will in general have multiple uh, cores, which are the processing units available on the on the machine. And so this is a this here is basically a graphical representation of what your laptop uh, might look like. It will have um, it will have a multi-core chip, so it'll have one chip. Um, is also referred to as a processor each and that chip will then uh, probably have multiple cores. So in this graphical representation, there are four cores on this uh, chip and all of those cores use the same uh, RAM, the same me main memory. So if you, if, um, so basically any node on Savio is, is basically something that looks like this, except all of the nodes on Savio actually have multiple CPUs or processors and each of those CPUs or processors has multiple cores. So you can think of a Savio node as basically being this uh, graphic here, except the green box is replicated multiple times. So an example would be the Savio 2 nodes. So the Savio 2 nodes have two of these, have two uh, Haswell processors. So, so there would be two green boxes and each of the processors has 12 cores. So instead of the four cores that are shown here, there would be 12 uh, cores. So in total, there are 24 cores on most of the Savio 2 nodes that you can uh, take advantage of for, your, for running code in parallel. So another sort of graphical representation of what, um, what this would look like is, is just linked to here. You can think of a cluster as being basically, let me try and zoom in here, as basically just a, uh, a set of multiple nodes. Each one of those nodes has multiple processors. Each one of those processors has multiple cores and all of the cores on a node share the same main memory here. And then the cluster is composed of, of, you know, collectively of hundreds or thousands of nodes, depending on what system you're on. Um, so for our purposes, for, for, for the perspective, the kind of parallelization that we're going to be talking about here, we're going to ignore the fact that these cores are on different processors and just think of, like in this case, we're just going to think of this as being 16 cores on the node that you have access to, or in the case of Savio 2, as um, 24 uh, cores that you, have, um, that you have access to do uh, parallel computing on. Okay, let me pause for a second and just see, are there any um, questions that anybody would like to ask? Yeah, so Amy, can you unmute Greg Lemieux? Hi, Greg, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just curious, um, are you gonna discuss the difference between uh, uh, threads and cores? Yeah, I'm gonna get to that in a second. Okay, thanks. Okay, so that's a good lead in. I have, I have some terms defined here, some of which we've already discussed. So we're gonna use the term core to mean the different processing units available on a single node. We're gonna ignore the fact that those cores are um, collected on a set of CPUs or processors. So we're gonna sort of use the terms core, CPU and processor all interchangeably. Um, so threads gets used, the term threads gets used in different ways. Um, one way it gets used is, is in terms of hardware threads. And so on some particular kinds of processors, each core can have multiple hardware threads. And depending on how a system is set up, in some cases, those separate thread, hardware threads are viewed as separate cores. On Savio, um, they're not. And so we're gonna basically sort of ignore this, this uh, possibility of, of having hardware threads. Um, the next set of terms I wanna talk about is terms that relate to the processes that you will be running as part of your program. So you can, I'm gonna call a process as just an individual running instance of a program. And so if you looked on a, using a command like top or ps, each process will have a separate line that is being reported from the operating system. Uh, now there are also things called software threads that are distinct from hardware threads. And we'll see a little bit more about this, but basically uh, a software thread would be a case where you have a single process running and then the code has been written such that that process can basically split into multiple threads that can, uh, can act and can do computation in parallel. And then they sort of join back together when the parallel computation is done. So you can think of of these as, as sort of lightweight processes, um, but people will generally refer to them as, as threads. 
And if you have a threaded program and you're using a command like top or PS to monitor the, um, the program, you will see that, uh, that threaded program potentially showing more than 100% of CPU usage. And that's not magic, it's just a reflection of the fact that it's viewed by the operating system as a single process, um, but it is using multiple cores behind the scenes and that's why you can go, go greater than 100% of CPU usage. Okay, when, particularly when people are talking about Python or R or MATLAB, people will also use, often use the term workers. And so by that, we just mean the individual processes that are carrying out a parallelized computation. And so you can start up multiple workers that in, parallel, in Python or R or MATLAB to do your computations. And then the term task is sort of an overloaded task uh, in this context. So I'm generally gonna be referring to tasks as the individual computations that you need to get done. So maybe you're doing a parameter sweep and you need to do a computation across 500 different sets of parameters. So you'd have 500 tasks, or maybe you need to do a computation across uh, 400 different uh, data sets. So you would have 400 different tasks, one task for each data set. The confusing thing is that uh, if you're using MPI or Slurm, they refer to tasks basically to refer to individual processes. Whereas where we're, I, at least I and maybe my colleagues are mostly gonna be referring to tasks to refer to the actual computations that you need to get done. You need to do some sort of overall computation. You're going to break that up into um, some number of, of tasks that, that can be done in parallel. Okay, so a few uh, high level consideration, considerations. Um, in general, if we've got a certain number of cores on a node, we don't want to be running more processes or more combinations of processes and threads than we have the number of cores on a node. Um, and in general, if we want to effectively use all of the cores on a machine, we want to have at least as many computational tasks as we do cores that are available to us. And then the other, other point to be made here is just this sort of hierarchy of speed if you're doing computation, which is if you're getting uh, data from the CPU cache to the CPU to actually do computation, that's going to happen very quickly. Getting data from main memory from RAM is slower than that. And then when you start to get to moving data between nodes or reading data off, dis off disk, that's even slower than that. And if you're reading data and getting data over the internet, that's going to be even slower, uh, further, further slower. So that sort of gives you a sense of um, where, where some bottlenecks may come in as you're, as you're doing computation. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in a lot of what some people do, they're going to be limited by the, CPU, the speed of the CPU and how fast the CPU can actually do the, the computations that need to get done. In other cases, you may be constrained by the, the bandwidth between memory and the CPU of actually moving data from memory to the CPU to actually do computation. In other cases, you might get constrained by the um, bandwidth of being able to load data off of the file system if you're working with very large uh, data sets and having to read them from disk. And then um, there's this notion of Amdahl's law, which is that um, if you've got some large computation, um, that is part of it can be done in parallel and part of it can be done sequentially, then uh, you're going to be potentially you're going to be limited by the speed of the sequential part because that's the part that you're not that you're not parallelizing. Okay, so let me give an overview of some of the different types of parallelization, and these will then lead into some of the discussion that my colleagues will will provide later on. Actually, let me pause for a second and see are there any other um, questions that folks want to ask verbally? Okay, so the, the sorts of computations that we're going to talk about and that I'll give a bit of an overview here are um, embarrassingly parallel computations of multiple jobs on one or more nodes. So that's basically where you have some large computation, but you can naturally break it up into a smaller number of jobs, each of those jobs operating totally independently. Um, other kinds of parallelization that you might do is parallelizing one job over the, all this, uh, over the cores that are on one node, and that could either be a threat, either be using threaded code or using multiple processes to run a single job on uh, multiple cores on a machine. Um, it's also process, possible to parallelize a job over multiple nodes, so we'll talk about that. Um, and then the last thing, which we won't discuss today, is um, the possibility of using vectorized arithmetic on uh, more recent uh, CPUs. So that, that basically at the, at the chip level, the actual computations can be done uh, in parallel in a vectorized fashion. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about embarrassingly parallel computations. So I've sort of already defined this as that you, you're able to split up your overall computation to a certain number of, of tasks, often hundreds or thousands of tasks. And each of those tasks don't depend on each other. So there's, you can run them in any order and you just need to get back the results from all of those tasks. Um, so some of the ways to do this, that you can uh, do this is um, via a tool called GNU Parallel, which is a standard Linux tool. And Wei is gonna talk about this later on today. 
Um, we also have a Savio specific tool called HT Helper, which does uh, fairly similar things to what GNU Parallel can do. And we have some documentation um, on that if you want to um, look at that. Um, the other thing I'll note is there are things in Slurm called job arrays that allow you to take multiple jobs and sort of combine them together and submit them all at once. But the thing, the thing to be aware of there is that um, each of the elements of the job array will be done, um, will, uh, will be done on a single node. And so what that means is you, you would want each of the elements of the job array to be able to use all of the cores on the node effectively. Otherwise, you're basically wasting the um, computational resource. So job arrays in this context are maybe not, not a particularly helpful way to, to go. OK, so let me say, give an overview of what it looks like to do threaded computations. So as I mentioned before, if you're doing threaded computations, a single process is basically controlling the execution of your code. And then there are various code libraries of which is, uh, one standard one is OpenMP that will then allow you to write code um, such that uh, at a given point in the computation, the computation will split across multiple threads. Those kind of, the computation will be done in parallel and then the results will, will come back together. And so there's sort of a graphical representation of this down here. So here's your master thread, the main process. At a certain point in the code, it splits and it farms out the work to three separate threads. When those threads are done, the results can get combined back together. Then maybe there's another set of uh, serial code that's happening that is not in parallel. And then the code could split again, maybe this time into four separate threads that are going to do something else in parallel and so on and so forth. Um, and if you, I mentioned before that if you look at a job like this in top, you'll see something like this. So here's my single process ID for this process. And you'll see under CPU here that this, pro that this process is using 410 or 411% of CPU. So that's an indication that it is uh, using threaded code under the hood. And again, I said before, when we started that we weren't going to show, we weren't going to talk about how to actually parallelize your code. Um, but this is just gives you an example of what, um, what, a C, what some C code would look like that uses the OpenMP library to do parallelization. So there's some code here. And then there are these pragmas, if I can highlight this here. And basically, these pragmas then um, allow this block of code here to be run in parallel across multiple threads. And then later on down here, I have another pragma that sets up a for loop. And this for loop would be done by, across multiple threads, parallelizing the computation. So this is sort of the flavor of how you would write this kind of code if you were writing it yourself. Um, and this is sort of the high level view of what, um, what would be happening. And one nice thing, uh, but also dangerous thing about threaded code is those threads will share memory and share data structures and can write to those data structures. And all of the threads can write to the same data structure, which raises the obvious danger that those threads could interfere with each other and basically overwrite data in a, in a dangerous way. Um, and I see that there's a question coming in that I just happened to notice, so I'll just respond to it about reviewing how to best submit a job like this with, uh, with a threaded program on Savio. Um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that later. OK, so threaded computations come up um, in some cases because you actually use other software where, where developers have written that software to use threading. So that would be a case with uh, in MATLAB, a bunch of the vectorized calculations in MATLAB are threaded. And the linear algebra that it gets done in MATLAB is also threaded. Um, R and Python can also be set up, and they are in, on Savio set to rely on threaded linear algebra uh, using the OpenGloss pocket package. Um, and then you can also write your own code to, to do threading. So you could write your own OpenMP code. You could write your own pthreads code. You could write your own threaded building blocks uh, code. OK, so another way that you could uh, do parallelization on uh, one node is to set up the code so it uses multiple processes to do those computations. And so in Python, R, and MATLAB, it's pretty easy to basically set up uh, uh, those software so that they will start up multiple workers farm out your computation. Again, this would have to be independent computations. Farm out your, the computations and then collect the results back uh, to, the, to a master process. And so if you looked on top or um, if you looked on top to see what this would look like, you would see something like this where you'd have, say, five separate processes, each one of them using up to 100% of CPU and each one of them running the same command. So this is a, a multi-process R job um, where whichever one of these has the lowest PID is presumably the master process, and then it started um, the other processes here. So in Python, you can do things like this with Dask, IPy Parallel, and Ray. In R, things like Future, ForEach, and ParL Apply, and in MATLAB using uh, Par4. Um, and in general, in general, this is quite easy to set up if you're going to run across one node. Uh, in most cases, you can also do this in Python R or MATLAB across multiple nodes, but it requires a little bit more um, setup that we may see at the end. 
Okay, and then the last um, sort of high level um, kind of parallelization that I'll discuss here is distributed computation. And by distributed, we mean distributed across multiple nodes. Um, and so traditional high performance computing is really set up to do this effectively and to, to really take advantage of the fast networking to run large computations quickly across multiple nodes. And one of the standard ways this gets done is um, a protocol called MPI, which stands for the message passing interface, if I remember correctly. Um, and so basically, whoever's writing, writing uh, the code to be able to do this, they'll make use of the MPI protocol and the, M the MPI library that, are, that is being used to basically write code so that different processes are communicating with each other and passing information back and forth to allow a single computation to be done in parallel. So here's just a very toy example of compiling some C code that uses uh, MPI and then running it uh, using 20 separate, sorry, running it using, oops, using 20 separate uh, processes here. And in this case, this is just a hello world kind of example. So it just prints out and says hello from process number two out of the 20 that are being, that are being run. Um, and so the way this works is the same executable, executable, executable gets run uh, many times. There are multiple copies of the same executable being run. And the way that the, the way that the, the things get then get done in parallel is each of the separate um, uh, processes have a separate ID. And so the code is written such that it makes use of the different IDs to be able to do things, to have different processes do different parts of the computation. And the different processes then communicate with each other by sending messages which contain data or information to allow the, the parallelization, to allow the uh, computation to be done uh, in parallel. Um, so you can use MPI in a single node if you want. In general, it's used for running code across multiple uh, nodes. And the standard library is open uh, MPI, which is what is on uh, Savio. Okay, so there are various other kinds of parallel computing that we don't have time to go into here, um, both of which, both GPU computation and using Spark and Hadoop are available um, on Savio. Okay, and then the last thing that I will uh, say here before turning it over to Nicholas is just a few very high level considerations, some of which are somewhat duplicative of what I mentioned before. So the first of these is that you really wanna try and make use of all of the cores on a node. Um, so this would mean having as many worker processes as all of the codes cores that are available on the node. Um, and in general, having at least as many computational tasks you need to do as processes that you're running. And oftentimes you would have many more. So let's say you were running on two nodes and had access to 48 cores. You would then generally be running 48 separate processes and you might be then uh, using those processes to handle hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of separate computational tasks that you want to complete. Um, if you need more cores than are available on a single node or if you need more total memory, that would be the case when you would then uh, go to using multiple nodes. And then just a caution that you don't want to split up your work into very, very many tiny um, uh, tasks or very, very many worker processes that you had to have to start up. Um, and the reason is that there's always a, de a delay or a latency involved in starting up processes or sending data um, from one process to another. And so each time that you start up a process or send that, send that message, um, you invoke that, that delay. Um, and then a final thing to um, keep in mind is that um, if you have, a, uh, have tasks where the time it takes to complete those tasks is really highly heterogeneous, um, that can lead to what uh, computer scientists call poor load balancing. And so um, you would then want to th uh, think carefully about whether there are ways to uh, combine tasks together or order your tasks to, uh, so that you don't suffer from the possibility that you might have 20 things you need to get done, 19 of them finish very quickly, and then the 20th one is just taking hours and hours and hours, and you're only using one core out of, say, the 20 that are on a particular machine. Okay, so I think I will um, stop there. Um, let me pause for a minute and see if there are any questions that have come in. Are there any questions that people want to ask now before we switch gears a little bit? Or are there any questions um, in the chat that I should discuss, uh, Amy? Chris, it looks like there was just one question, but Nicholas is going to cover it in his section. So we'll hold off for now. Anybody want to ask um, any other questions? Okay, there's a question about Intel MPI. I think I will leave that to one of my colleagues to handle. Um, in the in the chat window. Any other questions that folks would like to ask? Okay, well, let me turn it over to Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas, remember, please introduce yourself and I'll let Nicholas uh, share his screen. Hi, 
Thanks, Chris. I'm Nicholas. I'm an undergrad, and I've been an intern at BRC for a few years now. I'll be going over um, storm submission options for using parallel tasks. I'll give a couple of examples, and then I'll go into how to monitor your job to make sure it's actually using the resources um, as you expect. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So submitting and monitoring jobs. So the first thing you want to take note of is what kind of hardware is available. In particular, you want to know how many CPU cores each node has and what the capabilities are of these nodes. So if you're on Savio, for example, we have 164 of those. Um, you can check S info to see how many are available if you're trying to decide like how many Savio nodes should I use. Um, perhaps if there's a lot available, you can bump that number up. If there's fewer, you can submit a smaller task. Um, but the important thing to note is that it has 20 CPU cores on each node. Um, Savio 2 has 24, and we have um, others listed on the Savio user guide. These will include GPU nodes and Savio 3. I think Savio 3 supports AVX 512, and Savio and Savio 2 support AVX 2, if your code happens to use those instructions. So once you know how many CPUs your job are, are available on the node, you can start setting up the Slurm scheduler parameters. So um, I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with Slurm, but if you're not Slurm as a scheduler, that allows you to request resources and queue your job. In case there's not enough nodes available, it'll wait in the queue and then later on the job will run for you. There are a lot of environment variables Slurm provides to help you with parallelism. Um, this is just a few of the most important examples. So I'll go over these. Slurm n nodes is the total number of nodes in the jobs resource allocation. So you can have your code look at this environment variable or use this environment variable in your Slurm script as a command line option. I'll give an example of this. Um, and this will enable you to access how many nodes are available in your jobs resource allocation. You can also get the list of node host names that are available to your job. For example, some Python libraries tend to do communication over SSH instead as an alternative to MPI. So they would look at this Slurm node list to get those host names. Um, the Slurm job CPUs per node is the number of processors available to the job on this node. So that's a programmatic way to access like Savio has 20 CPU cores or Savio 2 has 24 CPU cores. And then you can switch out your partition and you won't have to change your code if you use this environment variable. And Slurm CPUs per task is the number of CPUs requested per task. This is something you would put as a parameter in your job script and then you can access it as this environment variable in your code. Are there any questions so far? Check the chat. Okay. If there's no questions, I'll keep going. Yep. All right. So the first example is an OpenMP job. Like Chris mentioned, OpenMP can take a single task and then it will um, do some computations and then split across multiple threads. So in this option, um, I think there was a question about this in the chat. We're going to use the CPUs per task option for Slurm. And then we're going to access the environment variable I talked about earlier to set the open MP number of threads to use. If you have another way of using multi-thread tasks, you can use um, the Slurm CPUs per task as well there. So in this job script, the important thing to note is we say number of tasks per node is one and CPUs per task is four. This is going to submit a job with four C using four CPU cores. And this Slurm CPUs per task environment variable is going to be four. So it's going to set OMP number of threads to four. And then when you run your script or your, or your binary or whatever your program is, it's going to look at this environment. You can set it up so it looks at this environment variable and then parallelizes over that number of threads. In this example, the important thing to note is that it says CPUs per task is four. But over here, we know that, sorry. But over here, we know that Savio actually has 20 CPUs per core in each node. And on Savio, you're provided exclusive access to the node. So this won't be using all the cores on the node. 
If you wanted to use all the cores on the node, you would have to set this to 20 in the case of Savio, or 24 in the case of Savio 2. The next, um, the next option, the next way to submit a job is an open MPI job. And this, in an open MPI job, instead of using one tech, one node, we use several nodes, and we can communicate between the nodes. So the important options here are that we say nodes equals two, and then we say that if this is a Savio partition, for example, we would have 20 tasks per nodes and one CPUs per task. This would use all 40 CPU cores available across the two nodes. Then you would module load and open MPI and do an MPI run. So any questions on the submission parameters? I don't see any. All right. Oh, here's one, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. What is, and what is number of tasks per node? It's a good question. That is the, um, so in OpenMPI, for example, it might look at the number, it might look at this environment variable, and then that would tell it how many tasks to run on a specific node. So we have two nodes, and we want to run 20 tasks on each. So we're going to end up running 40 tasks total, two times 20. What would happen if you asked for more tasks per node than are available? I think it might try to run all those tasks on, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it will try to run all those tasks on the node. You would just not get any speed up. It might actually be slower on a per task basis because it would try, kind of switch between. I think Is, I think actually Slurm wouldn't, wouldn't start the job, but I also could be wrong. It might not, it might not start the job. Okay, thank you. Is there any disadvantage when I use MPI code for using one node? I don't think so. I, I think it would be fine. For a multi-threaded process, is it usually best to use task per node equals number of CPUs available? Yeah, that's like the open MP example. It depends on your task, really. If you find that you can use all the CPU cores without running into other bottlenecks like memory contention or something like that, then you can then you should go ahead and use as many CPUs as are available because you're providing exclusive access, so you're paying for all of them. If it turns out that like running 20 tasks per node ends up running out of memory on the node, then you might want to bump that number down. So there's some cases where you wouldn't want to use all of it. How about the CPUs per task flag? So it, CPUs per task is just another way of dividing up CPUs and tasks. So if I said, for example, two CPUs per task, then I would have to bump the number of tasks per node down to 10. So total number, yeah. Is it possible to use two nodes for a single multi-threaded process? No, I don't think that's possible. You have to somehow pass information between them. Is there any significant difference in overhead memory capacity permitting between using CPUs per task equals total number of cores and CPU per task equals one minus total number of cores? And over. I, I think I'm not sure what you mean by overhead, but if you use fewer, if if memory capacity is or other bottlenecks aren't the problem, you would want to use as many CPU cores as possible. I don't know why you would want to use one minus the number of CPU cores. Okay, so I'm going to move on. So I'm going to give some examples, and then I'm going to show how to monitor the jobs. So the first example I have is an OpenMP example. Let's see. So I have this sbatch file, it's mpi.sbatch. And I'm going to use my account to submit on the Savio2 partition. I'm going to request two nodes. And I'm going to request 24 tasks per nodes because these are Savio 2 nodes. And each task gets one CPU. So 24 tasks using one CPU each, that, that's good. And two nodes is going to be 48 tasks total. 
going to give it 10 minutes. And this is just pretty much the same as the example in the slides. Nicholas, can you minimize your group chat window? Oh, you can see that. OK. Yep. <laughs> okay. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to S batch run that. And right here in this window, we see it's running now. Ran across two nodes. It was a pretty short job. And now it finished. So there's not much to see because it was such a short job. But we can take a look at what S account says. So we can this job ID and put it in here. So this is just an S account command with some extra options where you can take a look after the job is run and kind of get an idea of what kind of resource usage you had. So so there's a couple of things listed here. There's CPU time, number of CPUs, max RSS is the memory, and then the start and end time. The total CPU might give you an idea of how much CPU was used depending on how your task is structured. According to Slurm, this only use, looks at the parent process. So if it spawns some sub processes, you won't get an exactly accurate number here. Another way, another way to check CPU usage is during the job. So I have an example called um, calc.py, which is just a, uh, Python script that's going to run a bunch of multi-threaded. It's going to run a multi-threaded task. So we can take a look at the Slurm script for calc. There's nothing fancy here. It's just a Savio 2 request, one node, one task per node, since it's just the calc PY. It's not using OpenMP, so I don't have to change the environment variable. But if it was, I could read the environment variable and perhaps change the number of CPU cores from within the script, Python script itself. You can import some things to read the environment from Python. So I'm going to submit this job. And it looks like it's pending. Now it's running. So one thing you can do is actually attach your shell to the currently running job. So using this srun command. I can go something like s run job ID equals put the job ID here, dty bash. That just means to start a bash shell on the node. And I see my prompt change to the node that the job's running on. So there are a couple of commands I can use to check its current status. And look here, it's still running. So we can say uptime. And this will give the node's uptime and its current load average. So it looks like the load average is pretty low. So we might wonder why that is. So we can watch the load htop. And this will give a nice graphical sort of viewer of what's happening here. Hey, Nicholas. So, yeah. We, we have a question in the chat. OK. Can we mix threaded computation and multi-process computation across nodes, like having 12 tasks and each of them using four cores on two nodes? Somebody is saying, I think, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. You would just change the number of threads per task. Yeah, yeah that's a good example of when you would want to use the um, CPUs per task option in Slurm. In our, in our documentation, we refer to that as a hybrid job, and we have an example um, job script for that case. Thanks, Chris. Um, with regards, OK. Could you minimize your chat again? Yeah, sorry. OK, so you, you might have noticed while I was reading the chat that the CPU cores are were parallelized like this. They were all using high. Yeah, it's happening right now. And then they go down to like a single threaded stage. And this goes for a little while. And then you'll see the cores go up again. So this looking just watching this while your job is running can give you a really good sense of how your job is using resources and if there's some sort of bottleneck you can find. Um, yeah, so I recommend using this strategy. Um, there are some other things you can do when your job is running. So it looks like my job finished, so I'm just going to submit it again. You can also use Werewolf if you don't want to start a shell 
on the cost on the node itself. You go um, w wall j, and then you can put the job there, and it can tell you the CPU utilization at this time. So it looks like five percent. This is probably that single threaded stage, and then if we keep watching this, it might go go up eventually. You can also use meta cluster. This is kind of imprecise, but if you know what nodes you're on, it might be useful. There's a lot of nodes here. Kind of gives you a graph, graphical, a visual representation of the nodes. It's kind of hard to find what node you're on, 236. Um, they seem to be in order though, so it might be useful. I just mentioned it in case you're interested. Are there any questions about monitoring your jobs? I don't think there's any questions. Are there any questions I missed? Nope. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's it on submitting and monitoring parallel jobs. Um, as Chris mentioned, I think we'll be available for a little while after for kind of office hours if you have any specific questions about errors you encounter. All right, so I'll pass it over to um, Zitway next. Uh, I think Christopher's. Uh, Chris, Christopher yeah. next. Okay. And in, uh, make sure to introduce yourself, Christopher. All right, great. All right, thanks, Nicholas. Um, yeah, I'm Christopher Hans Soden. I'm one of the other domain consultants. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about using um, software that's already been. Uh, parallelized for you. So using existing software in a parallelized way, uh, which is mostly going to be advice on how to read the manual and what kinds of things to look for. So um, Amy, if you could enable screen sharing for me. Um, you don't see share screen um, in the bottom? Uh, I do, but I think maybe I'm logged in as a participant or something. It's telling me that it's currently disabled. I'm going to make you the host in that case. Here you go. Okay. I'll look at all those options. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I believe what I want is this one here. Okay. All good. Um, okay, so existing software, there are multiple different paradigms and ways that people will imp implement parallelization, but the three main ways that you'll come across it is uh, command line arguments, because much of the software is command line tools. Um, options that you set at compilation to produce separate parallelized executables, and by setting those options in configuration files or environment variables. Uh, so when you're looking through manuals, you want to be looking for uh, options like dash T or dash P, you know, standing for number of threads, processes, or cores. Um, these are conventionally used, um, but sometimes they're named weird things. So to look at this, we'll look at an example, which is uh, Bowtie 2. Bowtie 2 is a popular read aligner in bioinformatics. Um, next generation sequencing, such as genome sequencing, often produces millions or billions of short reads that come from random locations in the genome. And the process of figuring out where those short reads came from in the genome is known as alignment. And this task is highly parallelizable uh, because uh, aligning each read can be done independently. So uh, looking at Bowtie, um, when you start to read the manual of this software, under the section of building from source, it's very good in explicitly laying out how it implements its uh, parallelization, saying that it uses the threading, uh, threading building blocks library. And then it also has fallback to pthreads uh, if that's not available. Uh, further on in the manual, it tells you how to use this and how to set the number of threads you're using with this dash p option or dash dash threads. Um, and it 
is very nice in explicitly telling you how the memory footprint will scale as you increase um, the number of threads that you're running for your analysis. So Bowtie 2 clearly uses a multi-threading strategy um, and you can just by setting the option easily use all the cores available on a node but because it's a, a multi-threaded approach uh, Bowtie 2 can't be run across multiple different nodes at once. So if you need to parallelize a job further, you're going to have to split up the inputs and merge them afterwards yourself or by writing your own script. Um, okay. In contrast, uh, there's this tool BLAST, which stands for the Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. Um, this is another very common alignment tool, uh, but it's not designed to find the location of uh, uh, where reads come from in a genome, but rather to find the identity or origin of a larger anonymous sequence in the database of all known sequences. Um, so BLAST does implement some strategies to make query, you know, multiple queries faster. Um, if you give it an input file with multiple queries, it will go ahead and scan through the database searching for where each one of those queries uh, it has matches, um, and this can increase the memory use, this kind of batching approach. Um, if you read through the BLAST documentation, um, buried in the appendices, you can see that there's also a num threads option, um, and it gives a much more terse description of just the number of threads or CPUs to use in each BLAST search. So we're assuming that this is in fact threaded and will only want to run on the cores of a single node, um, but it's not clear on how any speed up is made um, if you go ahead and test the software, and oftentimes when you're using existing software, you will need to run some tests to see how it's performing. Uh, you can see that the num threads option results in really nonlinear speed up, and it quickly levels off at around four threads. Uh, so that actually makes Blast an excellent candidate for tools like New Parallel or HT Helper that Wei will discuss in the next section. Um, because splitting up your queries and running multiple instances of BLAST is going to be faster than actually using the parallelization option that's native in BLAST. Okay. Another bioinformatics tool is GATK, or the Genome Analysis Toolkit. This is a tool that's used to make statistical inferences about types of data like those produced by Bowtie 2, um, so from multiple sequences aligned to a genome. Um, Looking through the GATK manual, uh, I see some examples of how this terminology is used pretty loosely depending on, um, on the developer. So in the GATK uh, guides and forums, people talk about machines while we talk about nodes, but pretty clear there. They also talk about this concept of data threads versus CPU threads, which I'll get into. And they use uh, scatter gather, which is a general technique uh, that we've actually been talking about to describe multi-node processing as a paradigm. So anytime they're talking about scattergather, they're talking about multi-node processing. Um, they have a couple key options. They have dash NT for the number of threads and it's described as the number of data threads sent to the processor. And then they have this similar dash NCT, which controls the number of CPU threads allocated to each data thread, which uh, didn't make much sense to me. I couldn't really tell what they meant by that. But reading further into the guides, it seems that the dash NT threads cannot share memory while the dash NCT threads do use shared memory. So really, I think what they're talking about is essentially um, different processes here with independent memory uh, and then separate threads within each process using that shared memory. So GATK uh, is unfortunately not the best uh, documented in terms of parallelization, um, it, but it's also a big uh, toolkit. There are many different tools that have different resource needs and they give different recommended configurations for these different tools. So for example, this base recalibrator tool uh, can use uh, multi-threaded and then it also say it's supported for scattergather or multi-node processing. But when you look into the, uh, the manuals on what scattergather actually means, they say that they support the use of this WDL or workflow description language. So this is a scripting language that they support uh, that essentially generates multiple GATK calls. 
Um, so that could be one way to go about it, but you know, to my mind, it might be easier just to use new parallel for multiple node parallelism um, because it doesn't entail learning this whole other scripting language. Okay, some tools uh, you'll have to set options or different options during compilation to produce separate executables that uh, operate under different parallel paradigms. Uh, one example of this is this IQ tree uh, phylogenetic software that makes evolutionary trees. Um, it has an option dash NT where you set the number of CPU cores in the multi-core or essentially threaded uh, version. So using um, multiple cores on one node. Uh, and it also has this kind of, you can set it to auto where it will automatically determine the number of cores to use based on your system hardware, which is a kind of nice convenience feature that sometimes developers will implement. But IQtree also has an MPI version that has to be compiled separately. Um, you would just simply you know, load your compiler and open MPI. And then when you um, compile it, you'll set this you know, IQtree IQ flags equals MPI. Uh, and that'll produce this IQtree-MPI executable that you would use whenever running across multiple nodes. Finally, sometimes you have to set these parameters in config files or environment variables. And for this, I have a non-bioinformatics example, which is Abacus. This is a popular finite element analysis software, and I'm not a physicist or engineer, but my understanding is that this software tells you when your designs will break on fire or uh, uh, light on fire or break or other things. So uh, Abacus uses an environment uh, config file uh, that they talk about this abacus underscore v6.env and it's just a python syntax file that contains a bunch of variables such as the number of cpus to use the number of gpus to use or whether or not to use mpi okay um, so with that i'll see if there's any questions and then turn it over to way to talk about new parallel and running some of these um, uh, embarrassingly parallel jobs Hey, Christopher. Yes. Could you pass the host back to me? You can just okay. uh, scroll over where it says my name and the, like where my uh, video would be and click the three right dots and then make host. Okay. All right, I'll do that. And then I think Wei will take it away. Here we are. All right, I need you back. Thank you. Over to you, Wei. All right, let me share my screen. Do you have it? Yes. Hey, everyone. Glad to have you here. Uh, I'm Wei, uh, working with the BRC team to support the SAP users. And also, I spend a big chunk of time to support uh, the Lorentzian supercomputers. Uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So I want to pause for a second. So far, Chris, Nicholas, and Christopher have covered the concepts of parallel computing and to how to submit and monitor jobs on clusters and how to use some parallel features for existing tools. Now, as we all know that most uh, HPC users are not software, software developers. So it is not uncommon that the software tools you choose for your research only utilize maybe one core or maybe multiple cores at the most. So this is particularly true in the fields such as bioinformatics or uh, genomics, etc. But then the good news is that there are tools out there that can manage uh, serial jobs in the HPC environment. So this is what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to talk about uh, the GNU parallel. So embarrassing GNU parallel computation, uh, let me give you an uh, example. So we have, let's say we have a bunch of uh, protein FOXA files 
that you want to blast against the database. Uh, you may have thousands of hundreds of uh, these flops, flops of files using the same uh, blast application. So this is just a simple example. You have, I have only three here and you, you blast against a, a database and you have output uh, for the protein sequence. So you may say that, okay, I can use a for loop, right? For example, if I'm using SABU3, I have 32 cores on each node. I can say, okay, I can use for loop. And for each loop, I'm going to submit, I have a 32 jobs tasks and put them on the, to the background. And I will wait until the, all the 32 jobs are finished and I'll start the next, next batch. Of course, this is a way to do it. And what about when you have a multiple nodes, you want to run your blast on multiple nodes. What do you have to do if you're going to get, you have to do SS, sorry, you would have to do SSH into different nodes and then submit your blast job. So this can get your job submission script can get pretty messy very fast. What if we use GNU parallel right here? It's a one single line parallel dash a blast sh. That's it. It's simple as it is. So what is GNU parallel? A GNU parallel is a shell tool for executing independent jobs in parallel using one or more computers. And it's responsible for dynamically distributing the task across many cores or even many nodes. A job can be a single command or simple script. I'm going to talk about this in, in later slides. Um, applicable applications, a lot of times, the most common user cases is a series of jobs. And a multi-threaded jobs, yes, very common as well. MPI jobs, yes, can be used for GNU parallel, but it's, you know, MPI jobs can't by itself running on multiple nodes, so it's really not necessary using GNU parallel. All right, so um, when you think about group parallel, the first thing that comes to our mind is you have a list of tasks you want to do, right? So a simple format for GNU parallel is parallel. Let's see a very simple example. I'm just using parallel echo. What I want to display, I just want to display ABC. If you see three, three, col three columns in a row, that's the syntax for GNU parallel shows that following that is the input file, input data. And here is just the input from the directly from command line. You can see, okay, parallel echo, curly, curly uh, bracket. What is, that means, hey, this is where you're gonna put in the parameters from where the parameters coming from, which is from ABC. The second example, and I have I, I could have two sets of parameters, then two sets of three uh, colons A B C, and I, the second one is to say generate three integers. Um, so um, this is a you know a really simple way to use a group parallel just from the command line. All right, and for most cases for researchers, um, we have input files. Uh, we may have hundreds of hundreds of input files, maybe just various in terms of per parameters, um, uh, in terms of uh, data sets. So here we have, I have a really simple example. Um, actually, I could show these lines here is just to um, a, a one line of the code. You can put that into your, your um, terminal to create a data set. I have it here ready on. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, shoot. I got, I got disconnected. Just give me a second. Let me log in. All right. I'm going to do to scratch working. All right, so when, before you use parallel, you need to 
load a module, which is called the new. Parallel. All right, so parallel, the one I had before, echo, which is display. I can just repeat that here. I have two, three, four. It's simple like this. Um, I want to have two sets of example um, parameters, let's say that. A, B, and C. And then we have two sets. You may want to use a link. This is a flag. Shall I please put one? Um, one or two the index. Please take one from the first set of parameter and take the second from the second set of parameters. Um, and also, when let me give you another example here. Is I have a task. Task two is a comma separate file. So a lot of cases when you have an input file, you may have a several parameters. And for this simple case, I have three parameters, and it's uh, comma separate separated. So when I passes through the parameters. There's a flag I can use, column, set, and my input file is pass to So if uh, the, the flag from of using colon set, set will separate your parameters from the input file. And uh, typically, uh, the, par the parameters are separate by, by space. So that you can do whatever the way you want to do it, but using the flag of column set. All right, so now, I will show you my input file. This is an example. So this is what you have here in this line here. You create an input file folder and generate 500 files in that input folder. This is what I have. I have 500 input files and I want to process these files. And this is really simple. I just want to echo and put to echo to see what's in this, uh, to display what's in this text file. All right, so this is the way to you know, have an input file either directly from command line or from a task list. This is, oh, that by the way, how to generate a task list. That's very important here. Um, so what I do is here is just to, for the simplicity, you can copy this line here. And then you have a task list. So this task list is tell the group parallel, hey, this is my task that you need to process, which is what we are doing here. Parallel echo task list. There are two ways to provide a task list. One is use four columns, and the other one is use the flag dash, uh, uh, dash A. All right, here's the example I just showed to you. Uh, you this input file can be uh, common separated values. Um, I'll just give you an example. Before. All right, so next one uh, example is the same application fed with different parameter sets. So for this 
little example where I just want to display the host name and I want to say copy input file to the output file. The whole purpose of this example is to show you how the GNU parallel handles input file and also how to easily handle the output files given input file have different names output file would automatically generate different file names as well. So what do you have to do here is we'll do module load GNU parallel and you can make a um, separate directory output right there. And I'm going to run this command. All right, I want to explain this a little bit. Parallel is the tool and I have a job jobs for that means I want to run four parallel tasks at the same time. Dash A is the task list. Hey, this is my task list. Then next one in the uh, uh, in the double quotation is what all I want to do is display the host name and the copy input file to the output file. All right, the trick here is I have a curly bracket here. This is the first parameter for the echo command. And I have another parameter, which is output. Um, there's a, you know, this line of, uh, of several letters showing this is my output. I'm going to explain what's going on here. All right, when you see the, the flag jobs, it means number of tasks I want to run concurrently per node. Dash A, here's dash A, means, okay, this is my task list. And the first curly bracket is the parameter feeding into the echo command. And the first parameter taking one line from the task list which is I have 500 input files, right? So this would take one line at a time fit into echo command. And a second parameter I have here, now you can see is a curly bracket slash and dot. This means remove file path and extension. Slash is remove the file path and a dot is remove the extension. Because for a lot of times output, I want to have a different name corresponding to the input file. And then I would change into give me the path as an output. And it gave me file extension as dot o out. So this is a second parameter. So output slash curly bracket and out. So for each output, I would have a different output file name corresponding to the input file name. And oftentimes commands can be more than uh, one line of a code, can be a block of code. So here, then you can write a script to put all the lines of the code into a one script. The one we have is very simple. It's just the echo, it's just display the host name. But then you can put that into a, a, a script. I call that host the name dot sh. And all you, what you can, then, then the command you use to, for the Google parallel is parallel dash j4. I want to run four tasks at the same time. An input file is task, task list. And the command I want to use, or the application I want to use is the host name that's sh. And I have two parameters, curly one and curly two. The first one is input, the second one is output. Now this is my, uh, the, the host that's sh. You can see this little script has two parameters, dollar one, dollar two. So the first one is input, the dollar two is for the output file. All right, there are more GNU parallel flags that are available and here are, uh, is a list of several that uh, could be very useful, but there are more than this. I just want to point it out dry run. You can put dry run there, which means only print out the commands you want to run. It's going to run. It's not really physically processing those commands. And that's dash SSH login file. That's the note, uh, login note file, the note file that you apply the request for. For example, you request for one note or maybe five notes. So here is the note list and you put 
this flag uh, in front of the node list. Work DIR third is very important. By default, uh, if you have more than one uh, compute nodes, the default landing directory is the home. So you want to make sure that all the compute will land in the run directory, so you need this flag. Work there. Job log. Uh, this is a very useful. Uh, when I run the, uh, the parallel job, I always use that. Job log is to keep track of completed tasks, and it always goes hand in hand with resume. For example, if your job gets preempted by using low priority queue, and the next time when you res when the job uh, being resubmitted, we requeued, the job only started to run, uh, we'll, we'll pick up where it was left out last time. It's not going to repeat the task that has been run in the past. The flag progress is useful as well. It displays the job progress I'll show you uh, in a second. ETA is estimate time to, to, to complete to completion. Um, now, so if you want to see, okay, I have hundreds of tasks, how long it's going to end, but this is used for only for interactive, using interactive nodes. And also load, and I want to say, okay, um, please, I don't want my CPU being overloaded. I only want the, my CPUs to be uh, at the 30, at like 80% or 90% a threshold. Or no swap, that's for memory uh, usage and memory, the other one is memory free. I want to, when GNU Parallel, if you have this flag set up, the GNU Parallel will say, okay, if you have this much free memory available for the next job to be, to be submitted to, uh, to start running. So hey, those Wesley, are some of the flags. A quick clarification? Yes. Um, if I were to run use GNU parallel and I want to use it across more than one node, am I requ I'm required to use the SSH log file in file command? Absolutely. Uh, flag? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Uh, this is where you get you, you tell GNU parallel. Okay, this is my two nodes or five nodes that's going to be uh, to be. If you have a job dash dash job so dash job is twenty. That is twenty jobs per node. So if you request for five nodes, you'll be able to run hundred basically a task at the same time. Um, so here um, I can just do a demo or I can just show you the, my screenshot. I have a host file, um, which have two nodes, SAVU 148 and 149 SAVU 3. And all what I'm doing is I have this task list. Uh, I am going to show you. Maybe I'll just show you the, the head. All right, so I have 500 of those lines. That means I have five jobs, tasks to be run, need to be, need to be run. Um, and then my host file. I have two, two notes that I'm going to run my, my task. And the next line command is parallel progress. Please show me the progress of my 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 parallel running, and the ETA is giving me the estimate time to completion. SLF is the host name. WD is okay. My uh, the landing directory. Job log. Please keep a log for me so I know uh, which one has been finished. Resume is the parameter showing that if somehow. The, the 500 job didn't get finished next time you resume where it's left out last time. Jobs four here, I can only want to run four parallel tasks at the same time. Dash A is my input file. This is my task list. And this is my application, which is simple, just show host the name, input file, curly bracket here, which means please take one task from the task list, one time, one line at a time, and process. And the output file is the same, but output file format is changed between a little bit, so the output uh, files will have different names corresponding to input files. Once you start running, 
And you can see that. Estimate time, 61 seconds left, 60 seconds left, 60 seconds left. And average time, which node is running, um, how much time, and things like that. This is showing the progress. All right, so next one, I want to just give you a time comparison. For this 500 tasks, if I use typical way, I just want to use a full loop to process all these 500 tasks, copying input from input to the output directory. And this is, I'll just use a full loop. Loop 500 times. And the time for completion is eight seconds, right? Now I use GNU parallel. So here for comparison, I only submit one, let one job running con concurrently. Um, and the syntax is job one is one, and the input, input list, this is my task list, and this is the application input output. And I use seven seconds as well. The next one, I'm going to run four jobs at a time. And look at the completion time is up about a little bit over one second. So, uh, uh, so using this really directly, um, dramatically decrease the completion time. Um, here, I want to show you the job log a little bit. If I have one, I do have one. Job log. All right, this is my, how my job log looks like. Um, now you can see I have, you know, have the, from last one, I have finished all the jobs and the sequence, the host name, starting time, job run time. Um, if I can get this a little bigger. And what command I used, input file, output file. So this job log gave you a really concrete information. What has been done, what is, how it has been done. It's very useful. And uh, typically uh, this, this is a log file is, uh, it goes hand in hand with the resume flag. However, during debugging phase, and if you use the same log file, if everything has been finished and you say resume, your job will never run again because the Google Parallel sees the log file says, okay, all your jobs are co have completed. So it's, it, it's not going to run. So make sure that either you delete the, the job log file or you use a unique name, for example, Slurm job name as the log file so that your job will be running again next time when you do debugging. Um, so typically, typical use for GNU Parallel is you have the same application, same two, with a different parameter sets, different data set. However, you can also for GNU Parallel using a, you know, I want to run different commands as my uh, task list. And here is my task list. I want to do echo. I want to uh, show me the date. Oh, here's a duplicate. And I want to show uh, my machine's name and things like that. It's really simple. And then you can just run this parallel. Uh, J, I want to run two jobs at a time and give pipe this to the command list to the parallel. And it will run um, those different command, different tasks, or it's not the same application, different applications parallel on different cores which is not typical use, but you could use it this way. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, GNU Parallel is really good for serial jobs and good for multi-threaded jobs. And also you can, you, you know, uh, you can uh, use that for MPI applications as well. And here, um, I'm not going to run it again because of timing issue. Um, I have a, um, it's just a simple MPI application. Now, typical use, you would do MPI run, right? Uh, I have a parameter here, and that's the output, hello one, uh, from processor 
from which node and rank one out of two processors. And then you can also run this giving run this through GNU parallel. Okay, please give please run 16 tasks of such MPI job. And it does for you. Although this is not I you know it's not an ideal situation. Why would you want to use GNU parallel to run MPI jobs, right? Because MPI it by itself can run on multiple nodes already. But just showing that GNU parallel does have the capability of uh, managing MPI jobs as well. Um, here is a sample job submission script that of course, you depends on your application, you would have to customize this based on your application. Uh, but basically here, you need definitely to load the module and you need to export your work directory. So make sure um, your job will land on the right directory for, from each node. And here you want to export your jobs per node. That's very important. That's one of the most important parameters here. And for the demonstration here, I'm going to run however many cores on those nodes that I'm going to run that many jobs. So basically the slurm CPUs on each node and plus how many nodes I request, right? For Savio 3, for this one, I have two nodes, then there would be 64 jobs running. Um, hey, Wei. Yes. There's a question in the chat. Yes. Uh, via GNU Parallel, are tasks run in the order that they are written in the .lsk file? Yes. Thank it you. Does. Yes, it does. All those tasks are independent. Um, I don't think the order really matters, right? You just want to run through all those tasks. Uh, they're all independent. So the, but basically, it is taking from one by one from the top. Um, and then uh, here is a host file. You need to generate a host file for your job submission. And here is the typical, this is the typical way you've been using it for job submission um, on Savio or Lorenzim as well. Um, here is, I assume that your application using uh, one core per, per task, but then some applications do can uh, running on multiple threads. So if that's the case, you would have to, uh, job per nose, you would have to divide it, the number of threads for each task, right? Let's see uh, um, the blast. You can run one job on multiple threads. So that number has to be divided to get your jobs per, uh, the number of jobs per node. A way, I think I'm, it's a little confusing here because um, yeah. I, thought, I thought minus J was the number of jobs per node, but then you're you're setting that by multiplying by the number of nodes. Is that really what you mean to do here? Oh, a good catch. A good catch. You're right. That need to be changed. Yeah. That need to be okay, changed. So it's the case that the the jobs per node. Yeah, per node. The, this this one is gonna be yeah. This is gonna be taken away. Good catch. Somehow I was thinking of something. Yeah, and that would be the slurm CPUs on node, and divided by the number of threads. That's the jobs per node. Thank you, Chris. And can you can you wrap up in the next minute or so? Sure, sure, sure. And here, um, so um, so this is basically a sample, and then you would have to um customize this job submission script for based on your application. All right, so the summary here is the GNU parallels is really effective uh, and a simple tool to parallel your independent jobs. Reach, it has a lot of rich options and more need to, you know, you can, you can explore your, on your own to see which set of flags are useful for your application. Um, and uh, for, for good practice, I think normally you would use an interactive node to test your parameters and then sub before you submit uh, a, 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 um, the uh, production run. And for more information, of course, there is a, a, a lot of tutorials online talking about how to use Google Parallel so you can check them out. 
So given that, any more questions? Hey, there is one more question in the chat. Yeah. Are there any unique considerations for using GNU Parallel if I have a Python script that writes output to a database like SQLite? For example, is there any risk that I could lose output if multiple tasks end and write the result to the same SQLite database at the same time? Sure, yeah, yeah. Those have to be independent. Although uh, for the input output, they, they all have to be independent. If there are multiple files trying to write to the same location to the same file, I'm sure there will be contention right there. Also, I've seen issues with SQLite on NFS. So just in general, I'm not sure SQLite will work very well in the shared, shared file system, as opposed to link right, to right. Stack Overflow. Maybe system. somehow there is a, a intermediate step. You want to save the, the output somewhere uh, and then have another step to write back to the database somehow. All right. Any more questions? Okay, so I'm gonna take over for the last couple minutes and just um, close things out. Sorry for running a couple minutes over here, but let me just make some final comments. I'm gonna share my screen again. So we didn't get to the point of um, spending any time talking about parallelization in Python R or MATLAB, but I do have a number of slides here just giving an overview of this. Um, and we can also consult with people one-on-one -on -one, um, you know, via um, tickets submitted to our, um, our help system for, for this as well. But I guess I'll just mention at a high level that all of Python R and MATLAB, Python R and MATLAB can both uh, in some cases do some things threaded and more generally will do can do things across multiple workers each running on a, as a single process um, so you can make use of multiple cores by running multiple um, workers and so i give some sense of some of the different um, python and r packages that can get used in this way and then in matlab you can do things like using par4 um, so a little bit a little bit more detail here of just some of the different uh, functions and packages that you can use and there are actually more more packages for python and r for doing parallelization beyond just these ones that i that i highlight here um, and i do have a couple example scripts for running uh, python in parallel uh, via the dask package and for running r in parallel across multiple nodes via the future package um, so given that we're out of time, I won't go into this in detail, but this is here as a reference. Um, so the last thing I want to mention is just um, how you can get additional help. So um, you can, of course, email our uh, email into our uh, help system here. Um, we hold office hours on Wednesdays and Thursdays for an hour and a half. And those, given the current situation, are being done as virtual office hours. Um, and we can also help with questions about uh, data management uh, as well. And we have office hours for that at the, at the same time in the same location. Um, and then I think it's the case that we are still hiring um, folks uh, for as additional consultants. So if you're interested in that, um, please let us know. So um, why don't we close the sort of formal part of the, um, of the tutorial here. I hope this was useful to you. Hey, and if you're interested in, yes, I do. There is one question in the chat before you close. Uh, does parallel start the next job always on a different core? Is there a chance that it will run the next job on an already used core if the core is not at 100%? Um, Wei could, could uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's going to use a separate core for each of the separate uh, jobs. Thank you. Um, Okay, so if anybody has other questions in particular, sort of more in-depth questions where they want to talk to one of us one-on-one, uh, -on -one, we can use the, the breakout rooms here in Zoom uh, now, but I think why don't we uh, close off the, um, the sort of all the collective uh, discussion uh, at this point.